Hey, welcome. We're so glad you're here. Whether you're tuning in from church online, YouTube, Facebook, or our website, our podcast, or our app, there's so many places to tune in today. You know, I've been so thankful for technology in this past season. Different tools to keep us all connected has been awesome. But one of the things I've really missed during this pandemic era is having people over to my house for dinner. If you know me, I love food. I love cooking and I especially love barbecue. Among our staff here at the church, I've actually earned the nickname, the food pastor. And it's probably because I always have food at the top of my mind. One of my favorite things to do is to actually bring people together around a good meal. But Kirsten and I really miss having people Uh, to our house for dinner. But no matter how many times I have people over for dinner, whether I'm having two guests or I'm having 10, at some point during the night leading up to dinner, I'll be cooking and I'll stop dead in my tracks. I'll be momentarily arrested by this thought, will there be enough food? I frantically check and recheck my ingredients and do a quick head count, like how many people are gonna be there. But whatever the case is, dinner is in about an hour. So I have to work with what I have. I need to lean into my meal plan. And maybe you can agree with me. There's nothing worse than running out of food. Food is so good at bringing people together, but it loses its power if there's not enough of it. Let's pause right there. We'll come back to this idea in just a second. In this series, Jesus, through the book of Mark, we've been talking about how a personal relationship with Jesus can and should change everything in your life. This week, we find ourselves in Mark chapter eight, and we're talking about Jesus, the provider. Jesus, the provider. Essentially, Jesus is holding the biggest dinner party ever. He's teaching the crowd for three days, and he's got 4,000 hungry people around him. And the disciples ask Jesus a question quite similar to the question I ask myself when I'm hosting a dinner party. Will we have enough food to feed them? Let's take a look at this passage in Mark chapter eight. Grab your Bible today. Verse one, during those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They've already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home, or sorry, if I send them home hungry, they'll collapse in the way because some of them have come a long distance. His disciples answered, But where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed them? Let's pause here for a moment because I think it's a good question. See, the disciples are looking around and they see this huge crowd and they know how much food they brought. There's no way they can feed that many people. Feeding a crowd takes a plan. Feeding 4,000 people would actually take an army. It takes a measure of forethought. And if the disciples were anything like me, they might be looking at Jesus and thinking, You know, Jesus, I sincerely hope that compassion alone can feed these people. But Jesus had another plan. So we pick up the story in verse five. How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. When he'd taken the seven loaves and given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. And they did so. They had a few small fish as well. He gave thanks for them also and told the disciples to distribute them. The people ate and were satisfied. Come on, nothing better than a satisfying meal. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 were present. After he had sent them away, he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the region of Dalmanutha. See, I think this story is so timely for us today. Yes, it's miraculous. Jesus fed 4,000 people with seven loaves of bread and seven baskets were left over at the end. And yes, it happened 2,000 years ago, but I believe that it can impact us today. You know, I'm praying that God will open your eyes to see that Jesus wants to meet with you here right now today. And once we can see that Jesus is our provider for all things, physical, spiritual, and emotional, I think it has the power to change us forever. I know that talking about provision can be tricky, especially when you have deep needs. And at times it actually leads us to question Jesus, just like the disciples did. They asked him, Jesus, where are you gonna get enough bread to feed all these people? Jesus, how can you supply the needs of 4,000 hungry people? It's a legitimate question. 
And maybe you can look at your life, your situation, and you ask Jesus, Jesus, do you have enough bread to meet my needs? Jesus, do you actually care about what happens to me? And by the end of my message, my prayer for you is that you will have the answer to the most fundamental question, how can Jesus meet your needs? From our story in Mark chapter eight, we can see the different layers of Jesus' character. Mark is writing this book with the intention that he would highlight truths about Jesus and his character, truths that we can actually hold on to today. And the first truth I wanna share with you is that Jesus has compassion for your immediate needs. Jesus has compassion for your immediate needs. Look at what Jesus said to his disciples about the crowd. I have compassion for these people. They've already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they'll collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. Jesus was speaking to the crowd in a remote place. There was no Costco nearby. Click and collect wasn't invented yet. The disciples couldn't pull up on their donkey for some curbside pickup. So why did Jesus ask this impossible task from his disciples? If we back up to Mark chapter six, you might actually remember that Jesus had already fed a large crowd of 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. In that story, there were actually 12 baskets of leftovers. Is it like the disciples just forgot this huge miracle? I don't think so. They were actually wondering how they would feed this specific crowd. See, the difference is that the first crowd was mostly Jews and this crowd was Gentiles or non-Jews. Jesus was trying to teach his disciples that there's enough bread. There's enough provision for all people, Jews and non-Jews alike. And if we dig a little bit deeper, we see that Jesus was trying to show them that he in fact was and is the bread. In John chapter six, Jesus called himself the bread of life. What I love about this series is how we're closing the gap between the early believers and us today. You see, Jesus was the bread of life for the crowds, for the disciples, and he's actually the bread of life for you and for me today. So what does this mean? It means that no matter what your situation is today, Jesus has compassion for you. He doesn't wanna see you follow him and then collapse. He actually has the ability the power to provide for your needs. I don't want us to just brush past these ideas as normal or ordinary or even obvious. Someone needs to hear this today. Jesus cares about you. Jesus has compassion for you. Think about this. Your current level of need will never be greater than the love and compassion that Jesus has for you. Can I say that again? Your current level of need will never be greater than the love or compassion that Jesus has for you. We can all admit these pandemic times have been really long. And maybe you're dealing with the loss of a job or the decline of your health or the health of a family member or even a friend. Maybe you're simply trying to figure out schooling or, or your career. You could be working through relationship issues in your marriage or with your adult kids. We all have specific needs in our lives. If we know that Jesus has compassion for us, it actually means we can turn to him when we need something. Then the real question becomes this, do we have what it takes to surrender our needs to Jesus and see how he can meet them? Surrendering sounds really easy, but oftentimes in practice, it's really hard. A bunch of years ago, I was finishing up seminary school and I actually walked through a really long season of uncertainty. I was struggling with the calling to become a pastor and, and, and I was ready to throw in the towel on the whole thing, Bible college, Jesus, pastoring, all of it. And I can tell you, the nights were long. I felt conflicted and insecure. And I would actually sit awake at night wondering what I was gonna do. I underwent a constant barrage of self-doubt. I felt like I had this black cloud following me around everywhere I went. And I was sincerely at the end of me. 
And I wish I could say that this story had a miraculous ending. Like I spent one night and just got on my knees and prayed and the next day I woke up and everything was all right, but that's just not true. Instead, I made a choice about halfway through that year. I started to lift up my worries to Jesus through prayer. I began surrendering my needs to him and my wants to him on almost a daily basis. And every time these worries crept up into my mind, I would remind myself of the truth. Jesus, you have a plan for my life. I would remind myself that Jesus cares more about my future than I do. So you know what happened when I started to do this? I started to have enough peace to carry on, to finish strong, to lean into the calling I know that God has for me, to put aside my pride and actually look for divine opportunities. In that season, I learned that it wasn't my grades or even my bank balance that was gonna get me through. It was our faithful provider, Jesus Christ. He wasn't asleep at the wheel in my life. He was actually showing me his power to, to actually provide for my needs. He sustained me through that season. His compassion, his love for me was greater than my situation, what it looked like on the outside. And the same is true for you today too. If you surrender your needs to Jesus, he will help you overcome the worry and anxiety that shows up when we're in the tough situations in our lives. Jesus himself preached a sermon in Matthew chapter six. It's famous. You've probably heard of it. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. I'm gonna get it ready in my Bible. He said this starting in verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is life not more than food and the body not more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns and yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? Jesus is so blunt here that it's actually almost easy to disregard his statement. Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? Life is more than food and clothes. Life is more than our outward appearance. And if your heavenly father can take care of the birds of the sky, of course he can take care of your needs. So stop worrying, but for real, what if we took that passage at face value and applied it to our lives today? What if Jesus' words actually changed how we see the world in our own circumstances? I know what you may be thinking right now. That's nice, Chris, but you don't get it. You don't see how hard things are for me right now. It's different this time. Okay, I'm with you. Life can be nuanced and even complex sometimes. I probably don't know or understand your whole situation, but you know what? Jesus does. Jesus has compassion for your immediate needs. He cared for the crowd that day and he cares about what's happening in your life right now. Are you worried about a need in your life right now? Are you anxious about something going on in your situation? If this is true, would you take a moment right now and bring it to Jesus? Submit it to him. All you have to do is say, Jesus, I need help with blank. Jesus, I need help with whatever it is. I know you love me, Jesus. Show yourself powerful in my life. That's it. There's no trick to it. No magic formula. Take a moment right now. Confess your need to him. I'll wait. Surrender your needs to him and exchange them for the peace, the comfort, and the hope that only he can bring. Jesus has compassion for your immediate needs. Reach out to him and he will respond. He'll meet you right where you're at. So that's the first characteristic. The second one I want to talk to you about Jesus is that Jesus can supply all of our needs. Jesus can supply all of our needs. He has compassion for our immediate needs, but he actually also has the power to fulfill them. We believe that Jesus is God, okay? And part of him being God is that he is all knowing. Nothing is hidden from his sight. This means that he actually already knows everything that you need. And to add to that, we actually believe that Jesus can supply all of those needs. It's here 
that I want to actually pause on our story, excuse me, and talk briefly about the difference between wants and needs. There are things that we want in life, a nicer car, a bigger house, more job satisfaction, for our kids to become lawyers or doctors or a viral video star so they can look after us later in life. Okay, maybe not. And then there are things that we need in life. We need food, shelter, safety, love and belonging, even a great church family. So we have these wants and we have these needs. I think in our culture and especially during COVID, one thing we need more of in life is contentment. We need to stop being so concerned about all the things we want in life and work on being content with the things we have been given in this life. Oh, I went there. Contentment. It's a state of happiness or satisfaction in life. And if we look back at Mark chapter 8, when Jesus asked the disciples to feed the crowd, he doesn't just pass them a hundred bucks and say, get on with it. Instead, he asked them, how many loaves do you have? Jesus, the provider, actually didn't give them anything new. He worked with what the disciples already had. So I wonder, if you're in need today, what has God already given you that you can work with? We can even take it one step further and ask this, are you content with what Jesus has already provided you in your life? And if you're not, you might actually need to examine what's going on in your heart. This is no easy teaching by any means. It goes against everything our society says that we have to need. Even as I wrote this message, I was being targeted on social media to buy a new pair of wireless headphones. So I packed up my kids. I headed to Best Buy with the intention and the thought in mind, I need those headphones. But once I got there, I was reminded of this very point I'm preaching. Why am I not content with the several pairs of wired headphones that I have kicking around my house? Sure, it's okay to want nice things. That's okay. But are things getting in the way of us living a content, abundant life with Jesus? So you might be wondering, how do I find contentment in life? The Apostle Paul, one of Jesus's more famous followers, wrote in Philippians 4. I'm going to get it out for you today. He wrote this, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned that the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. This is one of the most famous verses in the Bible. It reads a bit differently, though, if we put it into context of being content in life. Notice how the international, New International Version translates it. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Paul is actually talking about a mindset shift towards contentment. See, Paul actually believed that Jesus would supply his every need. Paul knew this, that the secret to being content in life is not self-sufficiency, it's Christ's sufficiency. The secret to being content in life is not self-sufficiency, it's Christ's sufficiency. And you can spend your whole life building up things and not find contentment. You might get your family lined up just how you want them or land that perfect job. You may actually endlessly tweak the variables of your life to get it just perfect, justifying it as the search for happiness. But what if true contentment only comes through Jesus supplying your daily bread? More money couldn't give Paul contentment. An abundance of food didn't give Paul security. His mindset was that whatever he had, his relationship with Jesus would give him enough strength to continue. The hope that we have as Christians comes when we, when we realize that Jesus of Mark chapter 8 is actually with us right now. He has compassion on us. He sees our needs and he wants to supply them. We need to step away from this self-sufficiency mindset and actually lean into Christ's sufficiency in the face of our deepest trials and our deepest need. We need more of Jesus' all-sufficient power, not more of our all-sufficient power. Jesus, our provider, can supply 
all of our needs. As I wrap up today, I want to talk about one other need that Jesus can supply. Only he can fulfill this. And that's our need for a savior. Without Jesus, our sin, our wrongs, and our mistakes actually separate us from God. Jesus came to the earth. He lived a perfect, sinless life. He was arrested and he was tried and found guilty of a crime that he didn't commit. So he was beaten and eventually put to death for this crime, crucified. He was hung on a cross. And once he died, he was placed in a tomb and three days later, he rose again. He took the world's sin upon himself and made a way for us to have a real relationship with God. And maybe you're hearing this for the first time. You haven't started a relationship with Jesus Christ yet. I wanna tell you that when you place Jesus Christ as the leader, as the director of your life, he will provide you with eternal security, eternal life. That means that after you die, you spend eternity with God in his presence. And maybe it's your day to start this relationship with Jesus. All you have to do is invite him into your heart. And you do that by praying, by confessing these words, even by saying them out loud. I'm gonna pray a very simple prayer and you can repeat after me or say it in your own heart. It goes like this. Jesus, I'm sorry for the wrongs that I've done. I accept your gift of forgiveness for all of my sin. Thank you that you love me, that you gave your life for me. Please come into my life by your spirit. I choose to trust you today. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, I want to congratulate you. We want to help you live out this new life that you've started. So there's a number that's actually going to come up on the screen. If you text the word life to that number, we'll actually respond to you and help you take some of these next steps. If you prayed that prayer and you're watching on our church online platform, you can click the button in the chat that says raise hand. Fill out that form and we'll personally connect with you with more steps you can take. For everyone watching this today, I pray that you are so encouraged by the fact that Jesus is our provider. He cares about our immediate needs. He has the power and the ability to supply our needs. And he fills our greatest need in life, in life, the need for a savior. He's the bread of life. Would you submit your life to his all sufficient power and he will meet you in your time of need. Can I pray for you? Lord Jesus, I thank you for every person tuning in to this today. Whether it's in this moment on Sunday or another day during the week, I pray that God, you would meet us right where we are that we would see your power at work in our lives and that you would ultimately provide for each need that we have. God, we confess that sometimes we're not content with the things that we have. Would you forgive us of that? Would you show us how to lean into you more? Show us how to love you greater. And God, I pray that for each person listening to this right now, that you would bless them and that you would keep them, that you would nourish and sustain them because you are the bread of life. We choose to trust you today, God. We need you. So Lord, would you show up in a powerful and a mighty way in our lives? We thank you that you are so good and that you have given us everything that we have in this life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.